Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're here at the Palm Springs Air Museum. It's uh, Sunday, April 21, the year 2002. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, along with Ed Altshuler, and we're going to interview Mary Bradley. Mary was a little girl growing up on Malta during World War II. As you may or may not know, uh, Malta was an island in the Mediterranean, uh, very strategic during World War II. The Germans tr uh, bombed it practically all the time, tried to uh, invade it, was never successful. So we're going to talk to Mary about that and a lot of other stuff. Nice to have you here, Mary. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell me when and where were you born? I was born in Slema, Malta. How do you spell that? S L I. When, when was that? 1929, Christmas Day, 1929. Christmas Day, a good Christmas present. Huh? And your parents, uh, what were their names? My father was Albert McAuliffe, and my mother was Mary Stella McAuliffe. How do you spell McAuliffe? M-I-C-A-L-L-E-F. F is in Frank? F is in Frank. What is that, French or Italian, or what is that? Maltese. It's Maltese. Maltese. Well, we haven't been able to determine <laughs> what it is. Well, how far back can you trace your ancestors on Maltese? Fourteen generations. Fourteen? <laughs> well, where did they come from before that? <laughs> Phoenicia and Carthaginia. Is that right? Hannibal, Hannibal's friends? Mm, not really, but, <laughs> but they were um, traders. And they would make Malta their headquarters, and here's the result. And her father was an importer. So I asked the question. I can understand they're needing to import, but how did you pay for the imports that you got? You didn't have any because exports. Because they had big dockyards. Malta has many good harbors. Okay. And uh, of course, naturally, during the war, we had a lot of ships coming in for repair. And every man and woman, every able-bodied, was at work for the cause. And we went, uh, you went to school initially in Malta. Yes. Tell us about the schools in Malta. I went to a private school. Catholic school? Catholic school, but it was very private. And um, I had a very, very good beginning, because then the war came. And then we were lucky if we got a little bit of a lesson down the shelter. And if we did get a lesson, we were too hungry to remember anything. <laughs> tell, can you tell me about the Knights of Malta? Yes, the Knights of Malta were um, originally in Rhodes, the island of Rhodes, and uh, they got kicked out. And King Leopold of, was it Leopold of Spain, King of Spain, he awarded them the island. It was occupied then, and they made their headquarters over there. W about what year would this have been then, or what century? Fourteen something. That would be Ferdinand. King Ferdinand, you're right, yes. And um, they made their headquarters over there, and they built many palaces, brought a great deal of wealth with them, established hospitals over there, and... Uh, Was that a religious organization? The Knights of St. John, yes, they were the Crusaders. Right. Mm -hmm. from, from the leading families of, of Europe. Europe. All royalty, and subsequently, they were not supposed to marry, or um, you know, they were supposed to be celibate. But they left a lot of heirs. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way most celibates do <laughs> nowadays. It seems to be. Well, even long the, the popes were good at that too. Years they ago. sure. Were. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. I know. Now you said that you can trace your family tree back fourteen generations. That would be to what year then? About. Try 21 times 14. <laughs> I don't remember. It would be so 
240 years. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I remember going, my grandfather saying something like that. Well, where did the, the family originated in Carthage? And oh, well, not my family. Those were in ancient times. Ancestors. Ancestors. Who, but that's as far back as we can go. Did they come to Malta to trade? Netherlands. But your 14 generations are were all on Malta. You, oh yeah. You didn't. You don't know of any of your immediate relatives that would have come from somewhere else before that no. necessarily. Yeah. No. Let's let's go to that map. Uh, give her a, one of those yellow pencils. Uh, yeah. And uh, can you point to Malta? And I think it's down, down pretty far. Um, it's right here, but it doesn't right show there. as an island. It's just a name. It's so tiny. So I know, right. But you were saying, now where would Rhodes have been? Rhodes. Yeah, Greece. I can't remember. That was over towards Greece. Greece. But that's where we were talking about the Knights of Malta, or the Saint Knights yeah. of St. John's. Yeah where they had come from. But they they would have come more from They used to stop here to trade. Yeah. And they go the wrong way. Now, now let's, uh, yeah, uh, let, you know, let's look again over there. And let's talk about why that was strategic, why the Germans wanted it so much. Because it was centrally located, first of all. That's and Italy right up above it, more or less? Yeah, this is Sicily right here. Yeah. And Malta was over here. And I remember a great deal of talk about um, Rommel. Yes. Okay. And that and would be. In Hitler wanted to get rid of Malta because um, it was interfering with his plan. Because they were down in Libya and Tunisia, just right below right that, the, right in right, that area right. where Rommel yeah. was, right. So we were bombed between 14 and 21 times a day. As a little girl, that must have had a terrible impression on yeah, you. Th that's fine. You, Mary, you can sit down. Yeah. That's good. Did you, did you suffer, and have you gotten over it, or do you still recall the, the horror of that kind it of life? It made me extremely compassionate, extremely, to a point where, well, I can not hold any prejudice in me, because when you see human being torn apart, you know, parts of a human being. One human being looks like the other. Suffering is the same. Mary, did you have any Jewish people in, in Malta? No. That's interesting. What other religions were represented there other than Catholicism? Protestantism, because of the British. Is that so? I remember there were two mosques because we were occupied by the Moors yeah. for a long time. So there are two mosques, they're still there. And uh, now there is everything from Jehovah Witness down to Muslim and everything because the people have gotten, they go over there, they like it and they stay. That's what it is. What's the climate like there? Mine. Blue, blue waters. Blue. So blue they hurt your eyes when you look at them. When you look at the deep water between Malta and the other island of Gozo, it's island. Yeah. Uh, you're in the middle. You have to close your eyes because you think you're looking at a can of blue paint. <laughs> it's a sand. It's a sand white, kind of white sand. There's hardly any sand. There are only two small beaches. One is. Um, where St. Paul was shipwrecked, matter of fact, the beach is named, uh, named after him. And then there is another one at a place called the Meliha. And How do you spell that? I-L, that's a word for that. Meliha, M-E-L-L-I-E-H-A. Thank you. Hey, I got that one. <laughs> that was good. Mary, you, uh, you obviously had an unusual experience as a growing child or as a growing girl. This thing started when you were 10. And tell us something about those years. Other than, you know, well, we went to a shelter. What was it really like? What did you and your friends do when you wanted to play? You said that you were hungry most of the time. Why were you hungry? 
don't they grow any food there? In other words, give yeah. us a picture of life. Life in Malta depended on import. Okay? Life in Malta depended on import. And therefore, the convoys that tried to bring in supplies were mostly uh, maybe out of a convoy of 12 ships. Maybe one may make it in. Food was extremely scarce. We used to, between air raids, we used to go by the beach and see if there are any dead fish floating. Because, you know, the bombs would fall in the sea. Yeah. And they kill the fish. So sometimes they wash ashore. If we're lucky, we might get a fish. And then mother would make a pot, boiling water, she'd boil the fish, she'd find grass or whatever she could, and make a soup out of it. And that had to go between six people. Our ration was a, supposedly a pound of bread per human being, per person. Per day? Per day. But it was made full of sawdust and sand. And so a pound of bread would be maybe a slice. <laughs> that will have to do you all day. Water, well, we had wells. We had wells. So if they weren't destroyed, we would have some supply of water when we could get to it. Because like I said, you try to make it out of the shelter, next thing you know you're halfway home if it's still standing. You have to turn around and run like a bat out of hell back down into the shelter. Who, who bombs are... Did, did, you, uh, did you explain what the shelter was like? Yeah, was just gonna ask, what yeah there were the catacombs. The, were those built by someone or did they, they, were they built exist? They by oh, ancient catacombs. They connect to Rome. And the Romans, so. Romans built the catacombs? Mm, yes. It's, they, they, we still have the aqueducts from... Romans, that's very <laughs> and Well, the catacombs you think of in Rome is where the Christians hid mm -hmm, out. The during, same thing. We did did that happen too? So, when St. Paul, so he brought Christianity to... Uh, he brought Christianity. Uh, and, and the Romans were in control at that time? Of um, Malta? I don't think so. I can't remember. Well, were the Christians persecuted on Malta? It was the early Christians. No. No. Okay. No. Um, when St. Paul was shipwrecked in Malta, he had to stay in caves. He hid in caves with the prisoners he was transporting from Greece to Rome. He had to hide in a cave. And um, the Maltese people were watching. They didn't know what he was. They were uh, non-religious. And um, St. Paul was eating carob. You have a lot of it here. And that's what they lived on, carob and water. What's carob? Carob is, uh, looks like a brown, long, uh, hard... Vegetable? It's a plant? It's a plant. It grows on... C-A-R... C-A-R-O-B. I think they have it in Hawaii, too, I believe. They, they have a lot of it here. Every yard has it. They're very good. Tastes like licorice. <laughs> oh. Anyway, he was living on that and some water with his prisoners. And then they were trying to keep warm because there was a big storm. And he reached into a pile of wood and he got, got bitten by a viper. And Maltese people said, he's the leader, he's going to die. And they waited and waited, he didn't die. And uh, they went over to him, found out what was this all about. And uh, next thing he, he asked them to take them to, take them to his, their leader. The leader was Publius, King Publius. He had a very sick son. How do you spell Publius? P U B L I. <laughs> anyway, um, 
his, the son was very sick and St. Paul made a miracle. The son got up, walked away. And then the Maltese became Christianized as a result. There were in that many anyway. And uh, well, that's how that story ended with St. Paul. That's how they became Catholic. Now, it was interesting when I asked you to describe your early uh, childhood that you immediately turned to the problem of food and eating. There must have been other things that you did. How did you play? How did you get education? What did you... We didn't play. We didn't have time to play. Little girls had no time to play? No, we didn't have time to play. We had time to listen very carefully to hear the bombers coming in, those of us with, with good hearing. And if we heard in the air, we knew that they were going to be bombers. Sometimes we take shelter before the sirens go on. We could hear that. And then if the siren goes on without hearing the in the air, we knew it was going to be dog fights in the air. And I had gone upstairs on the roof many times. We had terraces like it's built like um, Israel, Malta. And uh, we would watch the air fights. See the airplanes coming down, you know? You know, it was scary because you right away you start feeling sorry for the victim, even if it's a German. See, and we were at that time also invaded by the Italians. They came with their U-boats and some very industrious Maltese people soon owned U-boats. <laughs> <laughs> they, they tried to land troops on the island with their yeah, U-boats, right with their sub live, submarines? Right oh. where I live. Right. That, you, I, well, you could see them coming in. It was oh. funny. And they said, no, no, don't shoot. <laughs> don't shoot them. Don't, we'll get those boats. And they, and they got the boats. What could they do with them? Put them in their barns in the countryside and save them. And then when the waters were clear of mines, they had a nice boat to use. Give her, give her this and have her talk about this a little bit since we're kind of talking on compassion and Germans and Italians. Yes. And so. This is... Show it, yeah, put it, up, put it up was, in your hand a little bit higher. Yeah. I was go. a little girl, as I said, at the, um, I think it was in the second year of the war. And we had some German, um, we had some German prisoners of war. And there was this prisoner, he was rebuilding the wall outside the officers' quarters, which was across the street from where I lived. And uh, I remember he called me over and, you know, motioned to me, and he uh, was saying something, my name, and he wanted to know my name, and he introduced himself as Otto Brust. Remember that. Brust. Brust. B R U S T. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, Good people, good people, but no peace people. And uh, he took this off and gave it to me. And I kept it all these years. I didn't want to show it to anybody because, you know, some people don't appreciate such things. And, uh, but I kept it, because I kept praying for that man. He looked very, very regal, princely, you might say. And uh, I felt sorry for him, watching him rebuild those heavy limestones which our buildings are built of. And uh, I kept it, brought it with me in 1947. And she wants to donate it to the museum today. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a, that's a great treasure. I'm, and I'm sorry it's not complete. It had a ribbon to it, you know, oh. a bar, but... We'll, we'll look up, we'll find out uh, 
what that means, and because we have all the insignia and stuff from all the different uh, armies. So we'll, but we'll that's know. what he yeah, gave we'll me. Let you know what it is. I was so proud. Mary, we've, we've talked about your early days and the, the concentration you made on food. We've talked about uh, your problems with the Germans bombing 20 times a day or more. What other special things do you remember about those early years? Okay. We were told right off the bat that everybody was going to have to do this share. Even the children? Even the children. Any able-bodied person, it was by direction of King George, I believe. And um, well, what can a child do? The first thing they made me do is pick up the body parts. So in 1939, you were how old? That's when the war started. Yeah. About, about 10. I was just a little girl, but listen, when all the little girls work, <laughs> they get married at 14. Most of the, they used to, not now. What language did you speak then? I mean, what was Maltese. And that is, 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 is a Latin type language? No, or? it's um, one of the most ancient seven Semitics. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people say shalom, we, sh we say slim. 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 How would you spell that if you were to spell it? S L I E M. They're all cousins. <laughs> There's the Semitic tribes, as they expanded, took on their own characteristics, right. but they're still cousins. We're so, all brothers. Nah, you know it. And what, and what other language did you speak besides that? Well, um, I. English became mandatory in schools, and because this was a British British possession. Possession. How did they get a hold of it? Lord Nelson liberated us from the Moors. What an interesting history! Unbelievable! It's unbelievable. And um, I learned how to speak Italian because I was a little bit of privilege. And uh, we had to learn how to understand opera. So I could speak Italian then as well. And uh, my education, like I said, if if we were lucky, if a teacher is still alive or whatever, they come down to show there and with candlelight or oil lamps, they would give us a lesson spelling or math. That's all they could do, really. Did you have nuns to te teach you? Um, the nuns that we had did have to close the schools because, first of all, there was no food. The families were to stay together. And they let us have whatever papers, you know, and uh, we learned from whatever they issued out of the schools. But, but prior to that, which what order did you have? Which nuns were, did you, were they? Oh, there were all kinds. I went to the uh, Clares. Poor Clares, yeah. Yeah, they didn't uh, go out beyond the walls of the convent. And I was in boarding school then. And then we had the nuns of St. Joseph. We had the Carmelites. My two sisters are Carmelites. Are they Carmelite nuns? Yeah, retired now, yes. Yeah. But they were Carmelite. I was just going to say, well, I'd like to know more about your family. You told us your father was an importer. And our ship went down the very first air raid, the Star of Malta. Oh, no. Star of Malta. It was in the harbor, Valletta Harbor, it went down. So that was the end of the good life for us. So yeah. what did you do? Your father, you had four children. My father joined the police. No, we had, we were six children. Six children? Six plus children. mother and father. Plus mother and father. So that's eight that had to be fed three times a day. That's right. If you were lucky, you got one time. Right. What, what were the names of your brothers and sisters? My oldest brother is Charles. And there's J 
Joseph, and there is Manuel. Manuel? Manuel. Then I have an older sister. Her name is Mary. Oh. <laughs> I have another sister. Her name is Antoinette. And I wasn't expected. And I was going to die when I was born because I was premature. And they baptized me at home. And they gave me the name of Mary because they didn't think about anything. In case I die, in Malta they have a custom that if a baby's going to die, be a boy or a girl, in those days, it would be named Mary. Boy or girl? Like the Germans, you know, they have born Maria. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it was, because they dedicate the baby to the Blessed Virgin. During, during those early days, what did you hear or think about America? Did you ever consider what we were doing or what we ought to do? My father had spent many, many years in the United States. Oh. And he always talked about America. And it was his intention that he would sell the business and bring us all to America to get an American education. He swore by America, so much so <coughs> that when he died, my father, I got permission from the consul to bury the American flag with him. He died embracing the American flag. What is the story? <laughs> yeah, I guess. And your father's name again was? Albert. Albert. And what was the last name? Michaela. So, how, tell us something about your sisters and brothers. Did Two of them became did, Carmelites. Did they all survive the war? Yes, we all survived. Because where we were in Slema, the officers' quarters was across the street from us. Um, and your Maltese officers? No, English. English officers? English. Okay. Down to the right, there was teeny barracks. Barracks, teeny. It was a fort, teeny fort. A small, small fort. Okay. Yeah. And um, we lived in a big, big house across from the American, uh, the, the military, British army. Yes, the officers. Quarters. That's where I met Otto Ghost, right across. Now, where, where, where am I? I was talking about. Talking about your family. My family. Sisters and okay, brothers. Okay, my three uh, brothers, they had to be taken out of college and go and work in the dockyard. Are you saying you had a college in Malta? Oh, yeah. Royal University of Malta? Oh, yeah. I lost our college and the Catholic college, very strict, very good. I told you the Maltese people are very well educated, especially nowadays. How big is Malta? Can you compare an island that we know around here to say like... Um, Catalina. Catalina, that's what I was going to... I don't know how mind. big Catalina is, but Malta is... Uh, I used to walk across every day to get this much milk from a farm. A friend of ours had a farm. They had goats. And that's how much milk I used to be able to get. And we all get a taste of it every day. So Malta is what? 220-something miles. That's a good well, well, I, well uh, how far from one side to the other, let's say? Um, how many miles? It. It's about nine miles. About nine miles. And the Isthmus of Malta, if you stand in the center of the Isthmus, you'll get wet because the water <laughs> comes to your feet. And if you, if, if you had a bigger map, you could see it. Oh, you know, it's kind of like Catalina there has are, an Isthmus, too. There are five islands. Okay. And all together, they comprise Malta. Yeah. Go then back to your chair. Okay, brothers. when you're talking. My brothers had to go to work in the dock. Where? In the dockyards. Dockyards. Where they fixed the ships and all that. And now you said they had to. They Who said to. they had to? The government. 
Otherwise, you don't get your bread. Well, that slice of bread and pork. If you don't get that, you go to sleep with a lot of noise <laughs> in your tummy. And uh, my sisters had to also work in a factory where they mend the uniforms for the military. And of course, the British, they have to have their shows. Okay, they have their shows. And my sisters used to manufacture the uh, costumes for their shows. It was really interesting. Was there a strong allegiance with the British by oh, the Maltese very much, people? Very much, yes. Very much. I think we liked them more than they liked us. Okay. And uh, we realized that we depended on their protection. At one point, I remember this, there was absolute silence for three days. There were no bombings, nothing. And the British soldiers and the military had abandoned Malta. If Rommel had found out about it, the, the troops moved out. Moved out, and then they turned back again. For some reason, they came back. We had no food, no water. We suffered. No food, no water, but there was silence. It was weird. For three days. I want to ask you again, did this experience leave a scar on you to this day? If I choose. I'm that kind of, I'm very, how shall I say, strong. I'm a very strong person. And I believe that the war made me strong. If I choose to dwell on it, I can go nuts. The scar, the only scar I have is I can't stand being hungry. As soon as my <laughs> alarm goes off, I have to eat something because I detest hunger. Hunger brings disease, and Lord knows everything does. Tell us about your two sisters who became Carmelites. What persuaded them to go into the, the religious order? And, and had they already yeah. done that during the, the war? The whole family was very religious to start with. Okay. They were teachers over there. They retired and decided that they didn't like the way the elderly are treated in this country. Yet, they're young enough, they were young enough to find employment elsewhere. And then they decided that being nuns would be the best thing for them. And it turned out okay because they went back to Malta. They were teaching Americanism. They were teaching poor children. Finally, they retired, and they're very happy. Living in Malta? Mm -hmm. And they will be very well taken care of when they become incapacitated. You realize, of course, that you will be able to send your sisters a copy of this tape. I will be more than happy. What is your message that you would like to give them if they were sitting here right now? I love them dearly, and now that they have accomplished what they set out to do, please come home. What brought you to America? My father wanted us to have an American education. He wanted us to be Americans, more than anything else. And my father died, but we made it here with my mother, so my father Buried in Malta. My mother is buried in Arlington, New Jersey. What brought you to, when you came here, your brothers didn't come with you? No, we all came together. Your brothers came, and your two sisters came, yes. and your My mother. mother. The whole family immigrated. Where did you settle? Bayonne, New Jersey. Why did you settle there? Because my uncle lived there. And your father's brother? Mm-hmm. And he had a business over there, and right away he said, you know, he sponsored us, and um, we started over there. I didn't like it very much. Why not? <laughs> it wasn't a place where I wanted to be. But anyhow, I wanted to become a nurse. So I went to England and became a nurse in England. Again, 
again, the compassion bit comes in, you know. So how long did you stay in England? I stayed in England five years. And you were a nurse there. And then did you come back here also? And then I got married and my husband said, no, you don't. You don't go to work. You stay home and take care of the family. <laughs> so I didn't utilize my British license. Is he, is he still alive? No, my husband died 20 years ago. So he was British then? No, my husband was American. Oh. But you, did you meet him in England or? No, I met him in New York University. You were going to NYU? Very classy university. Yes. My son went there. The Purple Violets. Yeah. Did, um, was this after you came back from England or before you yes, went over? Yes, after, immediately after I came back. But what prompted you to come back from England? I wanted to be near my family. I missed them. Yeah. I loved the English people. Where did you live in England? In England, in London. Yes. And I had friends over there. So when you came back and went to NYU, were any members of your family in New York? No, they were all in Bayonne. And then when they started to leave home one after the other, you know, the brothers went first. And uh, I moved away after my husband died. Where'd you go? I went to, all over the place, I went to Hawaii, stayed there a while, I went to Arizona. I stayed there a number of years, and I came over here to California. I was free. I could do what I want. <laughs> How long have you been here in Palm Springs? Ten years. you like it? I love it. Why well, you pick the best place on earth? Yes. <laughs> I'm urging everybody that's left in my family to move down here. Well, who's left? The boys? Um, four weeks ago, I lost a brother, Joseph. The boy, uh, I have a Emmanuel is in Bayonne still. What is he doing? He's retired. He was a marine engineer and um, married two children. And I have three daughters, but my daughters are all over the place. Are they all married? Yes, except the oldest one. The oldest one is a musician. She was a concert pianist. And she retired, and she went to uh, live in the Philippines now. Then I have one <laughs> in Kingman, Arizona, and um, she's everything. She's on the city council, she's going to law school, she's got a family, she's got three businesses to run. She's only four foot ten. <laughs> What are the names of your children? Uh, my middle one, the one I'm talking about, is Monica. Then I have the oldest one, the pianist is uh, Claudette. And then the baby is Yvonne. She lives in Florida. And she's a teacher. She has two children and family. What, what, was your, what was your husband's name? My husband's name was William Bradley. <laughs> Bill Bradley. Bill Bradley. Was he from New Jersey, too? <laughs> yes, he was from Bayonne. <laughs> like the basketball player. Yeah. yeah. A politician, right? <laughs> well, that too. But he started out as a basketball player. Played at Princeton. Yeah. And the Knicks. Yeah. So out of all of the life's experience that you have had, and it has certainly been a rich experience, what would you like to pass on to your grandchildren if they were here? What would you like to tell them about life and how to live, what to do? Talk against war. Teach your children against war. Pray and pray there is no more war. I am not afraid of anything, but listening to the news, and I'm a news junkie, okay? somehow I fixed it in my mind that it might be This brings to my mind the suffering of what we suffered in Malta, what the Jewish people suffered in concentration camps, what the Afghanistanis are suffering. It's not necessary. There does not have to be a war. We're now advanced and educated enough to be able to find 
and ways and means towards peace. Although I don't think this country is uh, readily going into war. They're trying to do what they can to keep it. But we, if all the mothers in the world prejudice their children against war instead of against one another one, this one has black hair, this one has this, this one, you know, even here, I myself have been treated with prejudice. Incredible prejudice. I don't believe it. Oh, yes. On what basis? The, the, the color of your skin? The color of my skin, my accent. Your <laughs> accent is British. What can That's I say? It's so slight. I know it. No one would notice it. I've been and here you have been time. subjected to prejudice? Yes. Give us an example. Employment. That's the worst. Shopping. I went to El Paseo to buy a gown. I was going to have the biggest date of my life. And I was treated like I was a thief. In one of those shops? In one of those shops. Oh. Things like that. I don't like to talk about it because this brings hatred. You know, but uh, if, like I said, if all mothers, I did it with my children. So did I. I did it. Don't teach your children prejudice. It's bad. Something that has to be learned too. And if if uh, we know our faith, this way we know that Jesus died on the cross for two major sins. One is the sin of prejudice, the other one is of greed. And that's an umbrella for all the other sins. I don't mean to pontificate, but Go it's ahead. a fact. You're a woman of rare wisdom. Thank you. I'd like to back up a little bit more back onto Malta during the war. There's a, a few things I would like to talk to you a little bit more about. Um, did any GIs, did any Americans uh, come to the island during the war at all? As um, a matter of fact, I had a conversation with my brother on the very recently when he worked on the um, destroyers and warships. They had to extricate bodies from, from the ships. That had been damaged in damaged battles. Damaged when, uh, soon after the war, I remember we met a lieutenant commander on the walk. It, there was a lull between air raids, and he was Carl Christofferson. He was from Chicago, and he was an editor on the Chicago Tribune. Oh, really? And he was uh, very interested in the family, in our family, and he tried to send us care packages. Only one got there, <laughs> and uh, he's dead now. But we, yes, there were. There were. And prior to the war, um, what was the relationship between the Maltese people and the British? I mean, was it like very close? It was very good. It's not very like tight. India or some of these other places where they wanted their independence. Well, again, little prejudice comes in. Uh, when I would be going to school and I would have my uniform on, it was very nice, the English children used to chase me and call me a Maltese goat. I think that's where I got tough <laughs> because I used to handle about five of them. Speaking of that, we used to have a Maltese cat which was short, gray hair. Is that is that really the cats like they have on Malta? I never saw one. Never I'm saw one. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, they also have Maltese falcons and Maltese yeah. Oh, yeah. dogs. <laughs> I never saw any of those. Well, yeah. That, uh, that was that movie, uh, Humphrey Bogart movie, The Maltese Falcon. Yeah. Uh, so they were, they were pretty close then. In World War One, did Malta get involved with that at all? As My you father was involved in World War, World War I. He was 14, but he was a big boy. And he lied. He said he was 17 and got into a conscription. His job, again, his job was to pick up the dead after the soldiers. The 
stretcher bearer kind of a thing, Red Cross. So he was, did he go to France and, or somewhere, or was it? Corsica or somewhere like that. I, I, I was too young to remember what he did, but he, that was his job, pick up the dead. Now your family were, when did they, when did you all realize that probably war was going to come? I know it started September 1st, but was there uneasiness, things like that, beforehand? I can only remember my father speaking at the dinner table, talking about Hitler marching into war Warsaw, Warsaw. Warsaw, and talking about, he had a name for the Germans that they used to use. I, it wasn't derogatory, but... Uh, the Bosch? Jerry's? Oh, that's American. I'll think of it later. But anyhow, he, Tedeschi. Oh, never heard the word. That's what he used to call it. But everybody used to call the German Tedeschi. You know how to spell it? Simple. T, I'll write it down so I can. T-E-D-E-S-K-I. See, I remember. He used to talk about them, and he used to say to my mom, Mariscal, I'm afraid there's going to be a war, and you kids are not going to like it. That's that's the only recollection I have. And, and when did things start to get better? I mean, towards, the, like when we started, when the Allies started winning, did things get better for you all then? In Malta, yeah. believe it or not, I left Malta in 1947, and we were still on the rationed bread. It was, you go into stores, nothing. The stores didn't even open. It was very, very difficult just to survive. My mother had to make me a dress. She had to take the upholstery off the couch. And the couch was bright red. So here I had this dress, bright red, with a lace collar. And when I walked, I had to walk like a tin, tin soldier <laughs> because it wouldn't give, you know. <laughs> but at least it covered me because you remember, even when you're a child, you grow. And uh, we couldn't find a piece of material. This was back in 1947. Okay, now you're about 16 or 17 years old. I was right. 16 when I came. Mm -hmm. 16. Now, did you have any boyfriends or anything when you were yes. 50 old? And I had the golden boy <laughs> of the football team. Of the football the, Just, I met him about four weeks before I left. And I said to myself, now I'm going to enjoy this. I'm not going to tell him I'm leaving. <laughs> And then he saw my picture in the paper waiting at the consulate door <laughs> in, <laughs> in the Times of Malta. And he was so mad, I remember that. Now, football, did you talk about soccer? Soccer, yeah. Yeah, yeah we had soccer in Malta. They took that very seriously. And, you, and Malta is quite different now than it was then? How well, so and why? Malta agreed. They took all those quaint homes. Of course, they were getting old. And uh, they built pigeon hutches. And uh, they built very, very high. And the streets were always very narrow to start with. So unfortunately, the sun doesn't set on the tarmac. And there is a lot of mildew because Malta is surrounded by water. Okay. So you'd be walking all day long in mud. That's one. Two, cars were allowed in the island and everybody had one or two cars and there are no garages. They're parked on the street and if this is the sidewalk over here, and it would be a narrow sidewalk. They would be parked like this, so you can't use the sidewalk. You have to walk on the street. 
and only one car can go at a time. And no, I, uh, it's not the same like it used to be, unfortunately. Of course, the population is growing. But the interesting thing in Malta is birth control was not allowed, okay, because it's a Catholic island. There were 275,000 population in the beginning of the war. Still the same. Very interesting. I think it's in the water. <laughs> they have to, oh yes, my brother, Charles, had worked on the first desalination factory, or what do you call it? Right, that's it. In Malta. To take the salt out of the water. That's right, because they didn't have any water over there. And now they have more than one. want to go and drink water and milk that would taste like a little bit of iodine in it. So do you think they're not having very many babies or a lot of people are leaving? Is that why the, I mean, coming to well, the States and elsewhere? They're not having any babies. Something has happened. Maybe God passed a miracle. <laughs> well, why is it that the well-to-do women in this country have a hard time conceiving? I don't know. I never investigated. I've heard. What? Pampered women. Pampered women. Well, I never called my wife pampered, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... It, it's uh, I read about it extensively, that uh, pampered women have a hard time conceiving. That's interesting. Your wife didn't have any problem, did she? No, not too much. Not Between too you, much. you have how many <laughs> daughters? Well, she wasn't all that pampered, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's degrees of pamperedness. <laughs> The, um, again, those shelters, those caves that you lived in, were they in, now, there's a lot of limestone. Yes. And so they were in like those catacombs or whatever were dug down in there. Were there churches and things down in the catacombs? In Valletta, the, the catacombs were in Valletta. And uh, the shelters we dug oh. were under 15 feet of rock. And those Germans used to drop clusters of bombs. So when you're under 15 feet of rock, the only thing you can think of is, is this my last breath? The noise, I am amazed that I still have my hearing. Now, I mean, it's, it's amazing that that you felt a closeness to this German prisoner after the Germans been bombing you and everything. Did everybody else feel that way, or was mm -hmm. there a lot of? Yes. Uh, did they try and just no. and harm the prisoners or anything? No, they respected them. It was there was a little bit of hostility against the Italians because we felt it was a tremendous injustice, injustice that they would turn against us. And there was this tremendous, and we felt that they didn't do their part in the war. I didn't quite understand it, but that's what I was telling. They didn't do their, well, they preferred to sing, you know. <laughs> and then they came after us by boats, <laughs> and their bombs didn't explode. Their bombs didn't, we had, my daddy had a, car in the garage and our house was on one side was four stories high. It was a very, very big house and it was built on a hill. So where the car was, it was 14 stories, uh, four stories, sorry. The bomb fell through the house and laid on top of the car and never exploded. So then you don't know if it's going to, if you get close to it, it's going to explode yeah, or not. Uh, so. They're fast. And we had a house in the so-called in the country, which is walking distance. <laughs> and we went to stay there until they removed that bomb. Now, is this still a British island? No. Malta won its dependence, I think. Is 
Was it that a republic good? or a kingdom today? It's a republic. Do you feel that was a good thing or for Malta or not? Yes, I think so. I think so because the Maltese people are very resourceful people. Very self-sufficient. Okay? They don't need anybody to tell them do this and do that and hold you like a slave. So when the Mal uh, when they left, yes, the Maltese people missed their friendship. But uh, it's much better for Malta that they have left. So they're, the people are pretty prosperous there now? Very prosperous. Very prosperous. See, the British, wherever they go, they don't educate the people. Okay? And the same as in India. And wherever you go, wherever it's British occupied, it's what's in it for England. That's the problem. So where do you live here in the desert now? I live near the uh, racket club. And what uh, what do you do? What what uh, type of recreation? What do you like to do? Here? I sit home and I dream about volunteering for this and volunteering for that. <laughs> Take care of my garden. I have a, a little too big for me, the house, but, uh, Well, we'd love for you to volunteer here a little bit. Really? I was Rather just going to say that. About it. I yeah. would love I mean, to. Well, you, oh, this is a great place to be. I'd love to. Do, and if you'd like to help us do what we're doing, this is the most fun. I mean, this is, I mean, this has made our day. I, I can speak for myself, I'm sure for Eddie, too. Sure. Yeah. It's, everyone has a, a wonderful story, and yours is special, but you. like you said, everyone's... I've done a lot of things in my life. You sure have. I, I flew an airplane, I said, <laughs> And uh, I've been on the Nimitz. Well, I presented my daughter to the Queen Mother. What didn't I do? My goodness. I worked very hard, too. Well, you would have a wonderful time here, and you would be surrounded by loving people and lots of single men. Are you interested in men? Well, I've been 20 years a widow. And <laughs> well, the time has come for you to get well, interested. If we, if we find the captain of the soccer team, would you be interested? <laughs> uh, let me see now. If he's very old, <laughs> very old, very rich, and ready to keel over. But then again, I don't need the money. So. <laughs> how, how, uh, how old do you think a man has to be before he's very old? If he comes around half an hour before he <laughs> I'm 82. Am I old enough? How old are you? 82. 82. That's right. That's not old today. David's only 50. No. Well. No, you'd have a lot of fun here. I yes, enjoy I'd it love so to. much. I really would. Okay, well, we'll, all right, we'll get that. That'll be a done deal. But we'll one thing I have wished that when you take up one of your planes, I go for a short ride with you. Could be. Can I do that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. I write that in the Times of Malta. I put it in the newspaper. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, tell me, now, you said you flew a plane one time? Yes. Tell me about that. I, there was this gentleman, he was 81 years old. This was how long, when? This was when I lived in Florida, about... 13 years ago, and we owned a piece of property a ranch up in Stewart, Florida. Where's where's that? Stewart, North Florida, and we had the children's horses over there and all. And um, I decided that I wanted to sell it because the children were no longer interested in their you know how it goes. They were no longer interested in their horses, so forth and so. So I hired this gentleman who had a plane, and I said to him, would you take me over the ranch in Stewart? And I look around to see the rate of growth, to see what I would, should ask for it. And uh, 
He fell asleep. <laughs> In the airplane? Oh my God. <laughs> Falls asleep? <laughs> Come up. And I said, please show me how to fly this thing. <laughs> and I would, you know, I had my eyes open to make sure that no airplane is coming close by. Anyhow, we landed successfully and then we returned home and my heart was <laughs> <laughs> That's an experience. Then it was, I, so I flew a plane short distance, but I did. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, the other time I was at the airport in St. Paul. Minnesota, and I started to write a book, you know, and I asked the, um, I asked the uh, pilot that was at the, the uh, and I said to him, please, tell me, I said, what do you call those things when you back on a plane? He looked at me, he said to me, he bust out laughing in my face, and he said to me, now why would you want to know what those things are? He said, those are wands. He said, why would you want to know? And I looked at him, and I said, well, I'm writing a book. And then he opened up, and he started telling me this, and telling me that, you know, and it was well, interesting. Well, tell me about the book you were writing. Oh, my husband had started it, and once in a while I go back to it, and it's about, um, well, actually, it's about if a patient received a transplant, a brain transplant, whose thoughts would he have? <laughs> the recipient or the donor? <laughs> now, think about that, okay? Think about that. That's deep. Yes, it is. So um, I had to devise this uh, very good mild priest that was in a very not rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, and he was being sent to a little town, quiet Mexican town in, in Texas, and on the same plane there was a criminal, a mafia henchman. Plane crashed, and the um, a scientist took the two men. One had his body crushed, and the other one had the brain stolen. And he transplanted brain, blood brain. You know how these things go. So once in a while, I go back to it because it's very amusing to me. It is. You know, look, I'll tell you something about writing. Right. And I've written over twenty books. You're a good man to know. Okay, tell me. <laughs> You're wasting your time on nonsense. You want to write a book, you write a book about things you really know about, the things you've told us, which are poignant, which are factual, which are intelligent. When, when David interviewed me, I took the tape home and I listened to it and I said, gosh, there's a real story here. So for the past couple of months, I've been writing my autobiography. Not in first person, in the third person. So when I say Ed went to college at the University of Missouri, I don't say I went, I say Ed went. But I, who knows me better than me, right? Right. Same right. thing is true of you. You have a fascinating story. Let's collaborate on the book. Let's have some fun. I yeah. want to tell you something. I hope that when you make your agreement with David, that you'll take over my place. I am so swamped. I've been up since 4 o'clock this morning helping my, my wife with her work. And between my wife and my one client and David, I'm just completely swamped, completely swamped. But I would, I would tell you this, that he's got some people on staff who are much better writers than I am, and, and he could put you in touch with one of them who might be interested. I think that would be fun. Oh, you've got a great story. Jeez. Oh, absolutely. A great story. When, now, you're going to get this tape, and you take it home and look at it, and think of yourself not as the one who is participating, but you're looking at a, a, a lady who has just given her a superficial picture right. of her life. It's not detailed. I don't know what your house looked like. I don't know when you say it had four stories. What was on the first story? What was on the second? Where did the girls sleep? Where did the boys sleep? 
How many bathrooms did you have? You've got a great story to tell. What are you wasting time on on fiction, pure fiction? Well, I tell you, I really appreciate your advice. Well, I usually give advice, as David <laughs> will tell you. I'm not bashful. But in this case, it's pretty good. It's I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what he's saying. David has had the experience of interviewing over 50 people like this. He's a master at this. Really, is supposed to be a dentist, but he's not. <laughs> he's really... <laughs> Well, with that, Mary, thank you so much. You're back. Thank you so much. It was great. Eddie, it you great. too. It's been an honor for me. Okay. Don't, don't leave. you got to get a tape. Oh, i got to get a tape. Okay, Mary. Um, why don't... Um, I guess... Well, you can start wherever you want, but I, I'm thinking about maybe... Uh, when you, the, they first started making the attacks, and or, or maybe a little before that, it, it, how did you know, or did did you know that they were going to be, you were going to be uh, attacked, and and go kind of go from there? Yes, um, I don't remember the oh, exact date. Oh, I'm sorry. Date. Hold, hold, wait, wait, just one second. I want to put this. <coughs> this is a oh. little better. Uh, this is a new camera. I've just started using it. They paid five thousand dollars for this. Okay, <laughs> and it's so expensive. It is, but it is very nice. started, we had been around the breakfast table, the whole family, and King George's voice was faltering. It came over the radio, and he regretfully announced that World War II is now on. And we all looked stunned at one another. But at the same time, we were a little bit excited because there was going to be a little change in life. We didn't know what we were in for. And somehow from that moment on, it was the very next day Everything became scarce. There's no food left. Somehow everybody hoarded everything. And um, the first air raid was early in the morning. It was, we didn't know what it was like. We rushed under the stairs thinking it was safe. I remember then there was, it wasn't a shelter, it was a cistern, a very big, big cistern that supplied the military with water. And my dad told us, let's go over there, and everybody else followed suit. And from that moment on, the bombs kept coming down. There was no stopping. Of course, when we got a break between air raids and we went outside for a breath of fresh air because it could get pretty stinky down there, you know, mildew and everything, and uh, all you see was destruction everywhere. And uh, naturally you go looking for your home and if it's still standing, you might run in and try and grab a bite to eat and get a little bit comfortable and all that and before you know it the siren goes on again and uh, it was continuous in one particular air raid um, 
our side, uh, our house was on a, built on a hill, so one side of it was two stories, the other side was four stories high, and it was the Italian air raids coming in. One bomb got a, a direct hit on our house because it was quite a large house, and it went through four stories of the house, landed in the garage on my dad's car. He was anguished and he was angry because he prized that car. But the bomb did not explode as so many other Italian bombs. Oh, I remember what the fishermen used to do. They used to take the bombs apart, take the explosives, and go fishing with them. It was something else. A lot of them died that way. Because they would throw it to blow up the fish, and then they could get that's the fish. That's right. That's what, because they would be in a hurry to get off the water. And uh, as I said, even eating the fish then wasn't that good because the waters were poisoned anyway. But we ate them, and we were all sick. And, of course, there was no... The infrastructure was destroyed. You can't do anything except go from one host house to the other. But my job uh, during the war, I was always interested in human beings, um, was to strip sheet, take the sh bed sheets, strip them in long strips, and roll them to make bandages for the wounded. And we used them all, believe me. And, and tell me how old you were then? I was nine years old when I started doing that. And about a year later, my job was to pick up body parts of those people who didn't quite make it down into the shelter and put them in barlock bags, tie them up. And I remember taking off an eyeball off the wall. It was splattered with blood. And I had to take a shard of glass and scrape the blood off this so that we were told if we didn't do this, we would have a plague all over again. I remember down the road, the demolition men, they were skinning rats, and they made a little bonfire, and they were actually cooking the rats. I don't remember seeing them eating it, but they were cooking them, and we were hungry enough to eat them. Medical help was hardly a available, and we had to help one another. But the camaraderie among the people was incredible. Everybody helping one another. And uh, we, we really did take care of one another as best we could. The war became intense. And we were told that every able-bodied person was to help any way they can. And we did. My brothers had their ears stuffed with mud so that they can stand next to the cannons and remove the shells so that the soldiers could work on that, that saved their hearing. And then later on, they had to go and work in the dockyard. We, they told us stories about how they were extricating from among the damage of the battleships, human beings that were sailors, and it was very, very emotional to us, but we did the best we could. 
Tell me about watching the, some of the air battles going on. Okay, we didn't know any better. But if it was going to be an air battle, we'd come out of the shelter, go on whatever was left of the building, go on the roofs, if there's a roof or a wall left, stand there and watch the battle. The, I remember the Spitfires very well. And then when the enemy was shot down, especially if it was Italian, and the plane would go spiraling down, we would all scream hooray <laughs> and hallelujah. <laughs> and we would root on the uh, the remaining airplanes, and uh, it was the uh, same way with the sea invasion. They had these big boats. That was the Italian invasion. They tried to land on the beaches, and the Maltese people could see them coming. They were waiting for them. And as soon as they land, came on land, the Maltese people went after them with their daggers and their rocks and whatever else they could pick up, killed all of them. And they took their liver and put it on the beach to dry in the sun, just like they did with Napoleon Bonaparte's men. That was something there used to doing, I suppose, but uh, that saved us because uh, if they landed, God knows. They, uh, the Italians could not stand up against Malta, no how. But uh, the continuous bombing did plow, so to speak, Malta, and thank God we had the um, catacombs and all different shelters and all that. But if people didn't die with the bombs from the air raids, they died with dysentery because the food was sparse and bad. When, the, when it was bad, what would be a typical day? What would you have to eat? Okay, there was a ration for us and we would have supposedly one pound of bread each. And if we were lucky, we would have to go to the Victory Kitchen where they would serve some kind of soup. It was awful, mostly water. But that slice of bread that they gave us weighed a pound and it was this thick and about this big, it didn't. It was not a pound of bread, because it was either full of sawdust or a little bit of sand thrown in it. And well, it was something in the stomach anyway that would keep you. And of course, we were all very numb from the lack of food and the experience. It was very numbing, very. Uh, Severe. What about water? Did you have enough water? On the well, we had the cisterns and wells. Each house had its own well. And if the house survived, there would be a well. If the house did not survive, we would dig to find the well. And that there was water, yes. But it had to be conserved because we did not know what was going to happen. And uh, I remember this incident after I was scraping the blood off the wall. My mom brought me my slice of bread cut in two, and there was corned beef, raw corned beef in it, and I couldn't eat it. Hungry as I was. Hungry as I was. And then would often fall asleep from tiredness. And it was... Were you fearful? Were you afraid of the future? I mean, 
most of the time, or did it just become so automatic you just went about and did things? It was, we were not certain of the future, that's one thing. We were determined to come through it. And being that Malta was 97 or 99 percent Catholic, they had tremendous faith. And we prayed and prayed. If we did nothing else, we prayed and prayed. And we believe it was the Blessed Virgin that saved us from the war. And you, you pray, um, do you have certain feasts or certain, uh, is Blessed Virgin the more or less a patron saint of Malta, would you say? Or, or yes, or? it was uh, Stella Maris, the, mm -hmm. which was uh, a star of, of the, the sea. sea. Mm -hmm. And she is credited with saving a ship in a big, big storm that couldn't make it into the harbor. And somehow the ship sailed into the harbor without any harm and they named the um, day for the Blessed Virgin and they built a beautiful, beautiful church as a result where I was baptized and it's still there today. It was bombed but they fixed it. it was be it's a beautiful church, yes. And you were talking, tell us a little bit about when the British had to leave the goal to fight in North Africa? Oh yeah, we don't know what had happened. One day we went out of the shoulder, uh, out of the shelters and there wasn't a soldier in sight. And since we lived close to a military barracks, we could see that there were no soldiers anywhere. Well, the airplanes started to come in to bomb the uh, island, and the Maltese people ran to the ammunition and the cannons, and they started shooting as best they can at the airplanes. And every man, woman, and child that was available was fighting the Germans by themselves. When the British learned that we were defending ourselves, that some of them came back and we were saved as a result. But we were three days without protection. I think the British had gone after Roma. Yeah. That's what had happened. And it was uh, unbelievable. How we survived, it's unbelievable. I remember when I was down the shelter, the doorway to the shelter was bombed. I had to, well, there were a lot of survivors, but I had to step over bodies to try and find my way out of the shelter. And thank God we were able to dig our way out of the place. Did you lose any of your good friends? Yes, Brian Webb, I remember him. He was my playmate. His father was a band master in the uh, British Army, and I remember picking him up after the bombing. He didn't quite make it to the shelter. And one of his limbs, I helped pick him up, but one of his limbs remained on the ground, and it was very devastating to me because Brian was my sweetheart. <laughs> he was so nice. But these things happen. I recall with the dysentery a continuous flow of dead being carried to go and be buried under some rubble until they could one day dig them out and put them in the cemetery. I remember that was continuous. All you see is dead going by dead corpses going by. And uh, Malta suffered a lot, but Malta also persevered because they had experience. <laughs> and 
and I know you were sharing about your feeling for servicemen and women from World War II. To this day, every time I meet or hear of a person who has served in any capacity in the military, I stop by and I tell them I want to thank you because without you, I would not be here today. Thank you for all you have done for me and the Maltese people and the rest of the people of the world because I feel obliged to this day, even recently in church, there was a man sitting behind me and he was serving in World War II and <clears throat> he was talking to me about how Malta suffered during the war and uh, he was um, the first one on a beach in France. I forget what the, na uh, the name of the beach was. And I remember turning around and saying to him, Frank, thank you. Thank you for serving during World War II because without you, I wouldn't exist today. And he said, you're the only one in all these years that remembered to say thank you. I never heard that before. And I kind of feel obliged to this day. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Mary. I think that's, that's really neat. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing and doing mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good, though. I don't know how good I was. I uh, kind no, of feel was, nervous. Uh, no, no, you were just fine. Just, just real good. Okay. Let's go find her.
Johnny, where were we? 